right, take your copy of the Word of God, if you would, turn to the book of Exodus, chapter number 25. Exodus, chapter number 25. And we have been dealing with the tabernacle and the things of the tabernacle. And one of the things that we've learned from Genesis chapter number 25 is did they start at the brazen altar and go to the Holy of Holies or did they start in the Holy of Holies and work their way back to the brazen altar? They started in the Holy of Holies and then began to work their way back according to the book of Exodus as you go through and you start looking at all of these items and the way that they're put in to a sequence inside of the scripture. Now, inside of the Holy of Holies was what? Was the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. Okay? What was inside, and you say, are we going back over this again? Repetition is the best teacher. So what was inside the Ark of the Covenant? Aaron's rod that budded, the pot of manna, and the Ten Commandments. And then what was the mercy seat? Anybody? It was the covering for the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? And it was the lid, if you want to call it, for the Ark of the Covenant. It is where the blood was applied when? On the Day of Atonement by whom? The High Priest. Okay? Also, that Ark of the Covenant or that mercy seat speaks about the what of God? The what? The Ark of the Covenant, the wood part, the acacia wood that it was made out of, speaks about the humanity of Christ. Okay, The gold represented the deity of Christ, which gave us the idea of what is called in theology the hypostatic union, which means what? That Jesus Christ was God... But he was man also. Okay? He hungered. He thirsted. He was weary and tired. He had to eat just like we do. But at the same token, the gold represents the deity of Jesus Christ. If there was one item that society is trying to take away from Christ today, what do you think it would be? The deity of Christ. You go into some religions and they're going to try to remove the deity of Christ. They don't mind the humanity of Christ. Because many of them, without calling him the Christ, the Messiah, would say that he was just a prophet. By just saying that he was just a prophet is taking away from the deity of Christ. But we know just by example of the ark and the mercy seat that it shows that he not only was a prophet, he was a high priest and our high priest according to the book of Hebrews. And he was also the king. And I made mention last week that Jesus Christ was born a king, lived a king, died a king, rose from the dead a king, and he's going to come back as the king. All of these items are represented represented inside the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. You see all of these items... The pot of manna. What did the pot of manna represent? The eternal bread of life. Okay? 
You go over to the book of John. One of the sayings where it says, one of the sayings of the I am, where he says, the I am the door, I am the, one of the statements he makes is that I am the bread of life. Okay? Also in that ark was Aaron's rod that budded. What did that pertain to? His resurrection. It also, the wood that is used and, and the, the flowers that were used on that rod represented that he was the first fruits that would be born. Okay? Then there was the Ten Commandments or the law. Now, here's what I love. Is that the law stated these items that we had mentioned. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not have any graven images. Thou shalt honor the Lord thy God. What? In not stealing, killing, honor your father and mother, the Sabbath, don't covet, don't take the Lord thy God's name in vain. All of these items, okay? What was so awesome about this is the fact where the blood was applied, it covered the law. Jesus said that I am not come to do away with the law or to destroy the law, but I have come to fulfill it. And uh, the awesome part about it is, is that the covering that took place of the blood over the law, I'm not under the law anymore, I'm an under grace because of that. Okay, so we go through and we've studied all of those things. We studied about the cherubim that covered the mercy seat. And now we're going to move on to a different portion in the book of Exodus, chapter number 25. And now we're going to move past the veil. Now I understand that there are three portions or three pieces of furniture inside the holy place, okay? We're going to get to the third one, but I'm going to start with one tonight, okay? And we'll dissect and go to the others. But let's look at verse number 23 of chapter 25. Because the next item in line is given to us in verse 23 where it says, Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood, or acacia wood. Two cubits shalt be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of a hand width round about, and thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shall the rings be for places of the staves, to bear the table. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, that the table may be born with them. You remember that this is to be portable. Right? Because whenever the children of Israel were told to move, they had to break down the tabernacle and move it. Okay? This is where the Lord would lead them by a pillar of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof and the spoons thereof and covers thereof and bowls thereof to cover withal. Of pure gold shalt thou make them. And thou shalt set upon the table... Show bread before me how often? Always. Okay? 
Now, in our study, we've gone back and we've looked at the dimensions of the tabernacle and of the court and of the holy place and of the holy of holies. We've looked at the ark and what it represents. We've looked at the mercy seat as Christ is our high priest in the shedding of the blood once for all. We've seen our previous studies and we know that the ark and the mercy seat are in the Holy of Holies. Please do not get the furniture mixed up of where it's going to be placed. Okay? What we're going to do this week is we're going to go and look in the holy place at one of the pieces of furniture and then we will move on. But you will remember that the tabernacle is set up and gives us the symbol of a what? A cross. If you were to take the tabernacle and you were to look at it from the entrance all the way back to the Holy of Holies and then go in into the holy place, you will see that the tabernacle is situated as a cross. And it gives us the symbol. And it works from the back to the front. Now, what I want to look at is this table of showbread. Because the holy place, I want us to catch this, the holy place is different than the holy of holies. Right? The holy of holies spoke about Christ in His Redemption and resurrection, correct? For all of mankind. You can't get to God without going through the blood. You can't do that. So our approach is very important. So when you get to the holy place, you're going to see that there are three pieces of furniture there. There's the table of showbread... There is the lampstand, and there is the altar of incense. Three items. We've spoken about two. There's three more there, and there's two on the outside. That makes up the number seven, which is the number of completion or the number of perfection. Okay? In that holy place, it speaks about life. It speaks about food. It speaks about fellowship. It speaks about light. It speaks about a fragrant incense. Now, the table of showbread is given to us in the portion of Scripture we just read. And it gives us the construction of the table of showbread. We know that it's made of shittim wood like every other thing that has been placed in the tabernacle, correct? Which is acacia wood. It gives us the description of it being three feet long, 18 inches wide, and 27 inches high. It's overlaid with gold, according to verse number 24, which gives us another example of this divine hypostatic union. Okay? Now, something you're going to notice, and I don't know if you can see it. I believe you can see it. I want you to notice at the top of this table... There is a lip, or what is called a crown, above the table itself. About four inches high. Okay? Three to four inches high. Somebody might look and say, Preacher, is that significant? Oh, yes, it is. It's very significant. 
but the whole table's overlaid with gold, and it has that edge that is in there. The border at the top of the table is a crown of gold. Okay? It's a crown of gold. That crown was to keep the bread from falling off the table. At the outer court, Jesus made, was made a little lower than the angels because of his suffering and death. The table and the altar of incense, you're going to see that that crown represents the Lord being crowned in glory and in honor. Now, you say, well, where are you going with this? Well, follow with me. After Jesus' sham trials, were the trials of Jesus Christ legit? No. The trials of Jesus Christ were people that were paid to come in and make false statements about Jesus Christ. There were people that came in and would make statements about Christ that were not true. So the trials of Jesus Christ were a sham. Because if you go back and you study in the New Testament, Pilate makes the statement, I find no fault in the man. But the Jewish leadership and the religious establishment of the day, they did not want this man to rule and reign because they had their own thing going on, didn't they? Let me just put it this way. They wanted power, and they were as crooked as a dog's hind leg, according to Kentucky Lango. All right? So they would pay people, just like they paid Judas the 30 pieces of silver to do what? Betray Jesus Christ with a kiss. So here the trials were, the, were, a, were a sham. Here they would flog or beat Jesus Christ with a cat of nine tails to the point where the book of Isaiah said that he was so marred you could not even recognize him as a human being. That inside the cat of nine tails, it wasn't just a regular whip. There were pieces of metal put inside of that whip. There were pieces of bone placed in that whip. And when they would whip Jesus Christ, they would not only take it across the top of his back and down his shoulders to the middle of his back and lower, they would take and they would wrap it around his side and gut him like a fish around from his side all the way to his back. And those pieces of bone would dig into the flesh and would tear him into pieces. I'm going to tell you this. I cannot even get a visual picture in my mind about how bad that is. I, I can't. I mean, we may have seen the Passion of the Christ, we may have seen other things and talked about it, but I've been preaching for over 40 years, and I cannot fathom in my mind this being done to an individual. But before he was crucified, the Roman soldiers, and here's where I want you to catch this, the Roman soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns. And I hope I do not hurt myself. And you have to handle that very gently because you will get poked. But they would take and they would twist together a crown of thorns 
and they say, set it or placed it or, if you want to, pushed it down on the head of Jesus Christ. They then put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. And what did they say? Hail, King of the Jews. Matthew 27 verse 29 says this, And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. John chapter number 19. John chapter 19, verse number 1 says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. That's where the cat of nine tails came in. That's where the beatings came in. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him." Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. While the crown of thorns would be exceedingly painful, you're going to notice that the crown of thorns is also what is called, and I want to get the name right here, um, the Eucubus, which is another name for Acacia, which means that the crown of thorns was made out of the same wood of the things built in the tabernacle. The crown of thorns was more about mockery than it was about pain. Because in both places that we read, it said that he did what? They mocked him as the king of the Jews. They beat him, they spat upon him, they insulted him. And then they crown him in a final mockery, taking a symbol of royalty and majesty, a crown, and shoving it down over his head, degrading him painfully. Now, as a Christian, I want to remind us of a couple of things pertaining to this. Now, it's amazing to me that the same wood that's used in the tabernacle was the same type of wood that was used in the plating of the crown. Because for Christians, the crown of thorns is a reminder of a couple of things. One, it was this. It showed us, one, that Jesus truly was a king. Because they did crown him. It may not be the crown we think that he should have received. But they did crown him. And see, the thing is, though, is that that's a reminder to us that one day the entire universe is going to bow to Jesus as king of kings and lord of lords. According to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Romans 14 put it this way, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. 
Revelation chapter 19 verse 16 says, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. And I love how that it is seen in the scripture. It is all capitalized letters. King of kings and Lord of lords. See, what the Roman soldiers meant as the mockery was in fact a picture of Christ in two different roles. First, as the suffering servant. Did Jesus suffer? He sure did. But do you know what that crown represents? Not only as him being king, but they placed this on his head. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run something by you here. And it just came to my mind. Do you remember over in the Old Testament when they would do the sacrifice? Remember that? On the, they would take two lamps. The sin would be placed on the head of the one. Then it would be sacrificed. The other one would be let go free. Okay. I want us to get this picture. Because the crown was not only of him being king of kings and lord of lords. But it was also a picture of our sin being placed on Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter number 53 makes reference to those items, to that sin. And if you were to go back to the book of Isaiah... Okay, Isaiah chapter 53, I want you to catch this, because he not only was the suffering servant where the sin of man was placed on Jesus, okay, I want you to catch this, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness, and when ye shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him, He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now, look at verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was where? Upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the very next verse tells us this, that he was oppressed and he was afflicted Yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Those Roman soldiers took and plaited a crown of thorns made of acacia wood. Now, does anybody have an idea what the average length of these thorns are? 
three to four inches. Now, let me just throw this in here. This, is, this won't cost you any extra. Have you ever thought about the fact that thorns usually show up on some of the most beautiful plants? How many of you like roses? Oh, the ladies love roses. You ever tried to pick them without getting stuck? But yet the scripture calls him the Rose of Sharon. Wow. There are other beautiful plants like holly or blackberry. But do you know that acacia wood blooms also? Just like Aaron's rod that budded. But it has these thorns that are three to four inches in length. Can you imagine when they shove that down on the brow of our Savior as a representation of Him not only being King, but Him bearing the sin of mankind? Wow. But Jesus was, endure, was willing to endure the pain, the insults, and the shame for us. Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. There is further symbolism embodied in the crown of thorns. And it's over in the Old Testament. Do you remember when Adam and Eve fell in the garden in chapter number 3? You remember that they were told not to partake of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, correct? And we know the deception of Satan himself in that chapter. But because of that, when Adam and Eve sinned, you remember that it brought evil upon man. There was a curse placed upon man, the world. Sin was passed because of the sin of Adam. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 puts it this way, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Correct? Well, if you get into chapter number 3, and you look at verse number 17 and 18, you're going to see that that curse involves something else. And unto Adam he said, verse 17, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat it all the days of thy life. Verse 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Okay? Okay? The Roman soldiers unknowingly took an object of a, the curse. The thorn was an object of the curse that was placed upon man. All the way back in the garden. And they took it and fashioned it into the crown for the one who would deliver us from the curse. Galatians chapter number 3 and verse 13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, 
For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. They took something that Christ had placed as a curse upon man, fashioned it into a crown, For the one to deliver us from it. And Christ in his perfect atoning sacrifice has delivered us from the curse of sin. Listen to me, dear Christian. Do you have to sin? Do I have to sin? Follow with me. Do we have to sin? Our sin is no different than it was all the way back in the garden. Just like Eve and Adam chose to disobey God, we now choose to disobey God. It is a choice that we make. Just like it was a choice that God made in that curse and those Roman soldiers taking that and making it in mockery. As a crown. Oh, hey, oh, king of the Jews. Do you see where this is going? This same representation is where our sin was placed on the head of Jesus Christ. And there he did what? He paid our sin debt. Adam and Eve chose to sin. Jesus chose to bear our sin. And even today, we choose whether, especially a lost person, chooses whether they're going to accept the payment for sin through Jesus Christ, or they're going to try to pay it themselves. And in paying it themselves, they're going to spend eternity in hell, separated from God. Do you see how all this is intertwined? We would look at that crown of thorns and say, man. But see, just as as that lip that is around the table of showbread is a crown of glory in showing that He is the King. Can I tell you that He is the King of our salvation? The one to receive honor and glory because of it. The crown should remind the believer of the crown of thorns. And we'll get into this more next week because we're going to look at the showbread itself. But my goodness. And I'll let you, I'll let you, I'm going to place this down here. Come take a look at this if you get a chance. If you get bold, put your finger up to one of those and just push it in just a tad. Because he is our King of glory. And He deserves our honor and our praise because He is the King of kings. Regardless of what the Roman soldiers were doing in mockery, that crown made Him my King, made Him your King. Okay. I don't know about you. This stuff's good. And it gets gooder and gooder and gooder and gooder. Okay? Bad English, but you know what I mean. All right? Let's be dismissed in prayer. Invite somebody to come with you this coming Lord's Day. 
I hope you've been praying for people to be saved. You know what? The reason why we do these special things, the reason we do the car show, the reason we do anything around here is to see people saved. That's our motive. That's, uh, and I'm not apologizing for that. That's our motive. Okay? On the tables out in the lobby, we have some, some brand new, brand spanking new door hangers. And I think they look sharp. Okay? Grab, some, grab a few of those. Take them with you. You say, uh, if those run out, I'll go to the office and get some more. Okay? But get those while you're out. Give them to somebody. If you're out walking the na- your neighborhood, put one on the door. It's an invitation to the church. And um, it's high quality. It's not just a piece of paper. Because we want to do things right for the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So grab some of those and, and take them with you. Invite folks to come. Keep talking it up. All right? Let's be dismissed in prayer and ask the Lord to continue to use us and grow us and, and help us be what we should be for Jesus Christ. Okay? Brother Martin, dismiss us, would you? Lord, thank you uh, for the past to bring the teaching of the tabernacle to us. Lord, forgive us for our not understanding, our lack of understanding how important this is. We just want to say with words that only it's all we can do is just say, help us and teach us and just draw us closer and closer to you. We love you. You deserve the best of everything. And Lord, we just need your help in every every walk of life. And we pray, Lord, that your will be done through us while we're here. And we pray for the ones that are sick. We pray, Lord, the ones that need you. I know we do. I know I do. And Lord, we just thank you for everything you do.